ISO 27001, Annex A520, information security within those supplier agreements. Okay, what we're looking at here is we're looking at having supplier agreements. We need agreements with all of our third party suppliers. So let's start at the very beginning, right? When we engage with a supplier, we need a legal mechanism, a legally binding mechanism between us and them for the services or products that they provide to us. That's the principle in which we're operating. What we would expect to see in place is a contract uh, between us and that third party supplier. Caveat. Now, what we get when it comes to the minutiae of running the third party supplier management is oftentimes you're not going to have a contract. You're going to have what they call terms of business. So it might be a product or services that you signed up for that you subscribe to. And there is no actual contract at the back of that. It's rare, but it does happen. That is also acceptable. When it comes to the 27,001 audit, we're going to do one of two things. We're either going to show that we have contracts in place and provide copies as part of that audit process for review, or we're going to show that we've got terms of business in place, we've got evidence of our purchase of that product uh, or service, uh, and then any other documentation that backs that up. So we want to show what we bought, the level that we bought it to, and we want to show any terms of business that go along with that. The kind of things that people are going to look for there um, when we're using terms of business is people buying lower level licenses, but then using them in a way that they weren't designed, right? Using the business class version of that. So they might buy a one person subscription to a product or service. They show that, yep, I've got evidences of it. Yep, I've got the terms of business. We look down the terms of business and it says either not for commercial use, not for term use or whatever it may be. So just watch out on that because it can catch you out. Now, when it comes to ISO 27001 Annex A520 information security in supplier agreements, all I can suggest heavily, strongly is that you get legal advice. I am not a lawyer. I cannot provide you with legal advice. I can provide you with templates and guidance that the standard requires, but you are going to need legal advice, right? The law is different in every jurisdiction, in every geography, in every industry. This is one of the areas, there are a few areas where you need that legal advice. If you don't get legal advice, it's on you, not on me, right? So you want to make sure that you've got legal advice when it comes to the contracts that you're entering into, right? So that's my little hashtag, my little sidebar. But if I have a supplier agreement, what are the kind of things that the standard is expecting to be in there? So obviously the, the contract itself is going to set out what the product or service it is that we're buying so that we can see exactly what it is that we're getting. Uh, and it's going to have a date on it. It's going to be in date for the time that you show the contract or that you're using that product or service. And then it's going to have some information security related elements within it. The level of that based on what the standard says. So just to recap on that. The relevant information security requirements should be established and agreed with each supplier based on the type of supplier relationship, right? So there isn't one, um, there isn't like one answer that meets all needs. You are going to have to uh, to tackle that, but there are things that you would expect that the guidance from the standard gives. So where you can, you should make sure that those agreements set out what is required, what will be done, who will do it, what happens if things go wrong. General guidance, what information is provided, accessed, what are, the, what are the methods for access? Within that agreement, we're looking at legal, legal contractual, regulatory requirements, uh, elements such as intellectual property that you might not have considered, the rights on that, who has that rights on that, copyright information, data protection requirements. So some good legal elements within there. We're going to be covering off things like the control and level of controls that are required by both parties. What does everybody need within that agreement? And we're going to be looking at acceptable use and unacceptable use of assets. We're going to be covering potentially in there how to grant, how to revoke, how to modify access. We're going to be looking at things like penalties, indemnities, um, remediation for failing to meet contracts, right? What happens if a contract doesn't doesn't execute, right? It doesn't do what it said it would do. What if something goes wrong with information security? Uh, what, what is the comeback on you? We're going to be clearly covering basics in there, right? Again, get a lawyer, but they're going to want contact information, right? Your legal entity, things like that, your tax, your VAT. Uh, there are going to be other pieces of uh, standard information that are required. We're going to be looking at, if relevant, screening of employees. What is it that we want uh, to do in terms of screening? Is it legally enforceable? Where it is? What level do we want to go to? We want to look at levels of assurance for information security. Are we including that in the agreement and the contract uh, that they are providing us with the levels of assurance, with certificates, with 27001 certificates, SOC 2 reports, 
uh, whatever it may be. Uh, we can consider including those within our agreements and many, many organizations uh, do uh, when, you, um, when you engage with them. Our agreements should include the right to audit. So the right to audit is, is fairly standard. It is one that you would want in there. What that means is it grants you uh, the right to audit uh, that supplier. Now, some of the large organizations, clearly AWS, Microsoft, and big players, they're not going to allow it, right? They're not going to allow you to go in and conduct an audit. But smaller suppliers, it should be something that you should consider putting in there. If something goes wrong, if a breach occurs, if you are not happy, if they can't provide you assurance, the right for you to go in and audit their information security uh, is, is going to be paramount. And you will find that the right to audit will occur um, with clients that you have not just suppliers, but your clients will include the right to audit in contracts and agreements with you, no doubt about it. Especially if you're going with global organizations, financial institutions, that's gonna be within there. So just be aware of that. We wanna look in our contract, do we include things in there about problem resolution? Do we include things around availability, backup of data, recovery of data? Do we include in there contractual timeframes for the recovery of products and services back to an operational level? Um, all for consideration. We want to look at including, if relevant, our processes for change management. How do we, how do we make changes to the contract, to the products, to the services? How is that change management handled? Obviously, we've covered off information transferred. First, we're going to look at termination. So, what, what does the contract, what does the agreement include in terms of terminating and ceasing uh, usage of products and services? Are there specific requirements that we want in there? Things around the destruction and the removal of data. Again, legally, do we want an agreement with the supplier that includes that and sets that out? Uh, and then what do we do handover when that contract ends? So those are some guidance, some considerations when it comes to having agreements, but you need a legally binding mechanism to evidence when it comes audit that shows the products or services that you've bought. You are then gonna need some level of assurance that they're doing the right thing for information security, but we're not covering that right now. Uh, we need that legally binding uh, agreement in place. We need to be able to evidence that. In the previous one, we looked at the processes around managing suppliers. So that's all gonna be recorded through that process and it's all gonna be included on that supplier register. And you are absolutely, we're gonna end this as we started this, gonna go and get legal advice and legal support, right? If you don't, it is on you. I cannot overemphasize that uh, getting legal support, legal counsel and legal help when it comes to anything legal, <laughs> including contracts and agreements, it shouldn't need saying, but it does. So that is supplier agreements. Uh, that is ISO 27001 Annex A. 520. In the next one, we're going to look at the ICT chain. We're going to look at uh, specific considerations around that. But my name is still Stuart Barker and I am still the ISO 27001 Ninja. And we are still continuing our journey through these lovely, lovely tutorials. So until the next one, peace out.